In this screencast, we will be discussing the extraintestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease as part three of our three-part series. Again, special thanks to my partners who assisted in developing this PowerPoint. At the end of this exhibit, you should be able to recognize and describe the common extraintestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease that we often will see on CT or MR enterography. These categorizations come from a very nice consensus paper published in Gastroenterology in 2018 by Bruning et al. Let's talk about why these extraintestinal manifestations are important. Well, one, they can be easily detected on CT or sometimes easily detected on MRI. And they are more common in Crohn's patients than they are in the general population. The manifestations of these various pathologies is going to be very similar uh, in a Crohn patient to what it would look like in a non-Crohn patient. So you're, you're really going to be familiar with a lot of these entities. It's really an emphasis on remembering to look for these in every patient with Crohn's disease. Oftentimes, when we have a complex CTE or a complex MRE, there's penetrating disease or multiple segments of active inflammation, perianal fistula, we get very wrapped up in providing a detailed description of the intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease, and we may forget to look for these other extraintestinal manifestations. So one, cholelithiasis, and all the downstream consequences of cholelithiasis. So Patients with Crohn's will have gallstones, and those gallstones can cause biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, and pancreatitis. Crohn's patients have a higher incidence of nephrolithiasis, which can be quite difficult to detect on MRE. So you're going to want to look for hydroureter, hydronephrosis, and areas of dephasing within the collecting system. Pancreatitis can occur in patients with Crohn's disease, and uh, that can manifest as interstitial edematous pancreatitis or at times necrotizing pancreatitis. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is something we more commonly think of in association with different forms of inflammatory bowel disease. And very early in the course of primary sclerosing cholangitis, the findings can be quite subtle. You may only see a few isolated, dilated intrahepatic bile ducts often in the periphery. As that disease progresses, it will then you know, show the more classic manifestations of alternating stricturing and dilation of the intrahepatic bile ducts. Sacroiliitis and avascular necrosis are two of the extraintestinal manifestations that I see very commonly on both MRE and CTE, and it is essential that you look for them in every patient. Um, sacroiliitis being an act of inflammation that could benefit from medical therapy, and avascular necrosis, often a consequence of high-dose steroid use in patients with Crohn's disease. Nephrolithiasis, cholelithiasis, right? Cholelithiasis. We can detect them, um, you know, a little bit harder to detect a, a kidney stone on MRE than CTE, but they're, they're the same thing that you're going to be uh, looking for on any other patient. It's just having to remember that uh, these are of higher incidence in patients with Crohn's disease and remember to go look for them. Osseous manifestations, again, I think I can't emphasize this enough. Once you start looking for this on your Crohn patients, you are going to see it all the time. So Crohn's disease puts patients at risk for avascular necrosis, also known as osteonecrosis of the femoral heads. It is due to repeat and or high dose steroid use. And when you see this classic serpiginous infarction within the femoral head, you want to say not only is there avascular necrosis present, yes or no, but also say whether there has been some degree of articular surface collapse. Because if the avascular necrosis progresses to the point in which there is articular surface collapse, this patient may require a hip arthroplasty due to secondary severe arthritis 
of the hips. Inflammatory sacroiliitis is a very common finding in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease. And in inflammatory sacroiliitis, you're going to look at the sacroiliac joints. You're going to look for joint-centered sclerosis and subtle periarticular erosions. On magnetic resonance imaging, you may see hyperenhancement along the joint line on your T1 gradient recalled echo post-contrast fat saturated imaging. This is an example of that where we have some periarticular edema. So this isn't a T1 post-con, but you can actually see edema along the joint line. Okay, At times this can be asymmetric. It does not have to be symmetric. But if you see edema and or enhancement on MRI, you can at least raise the suspicion of inflammatory sacroiliitis. This is a, a short segment. Again, the main emphasis of this screencast is to give you some examples of the common things that we see, but most importantly, to remind you to just have a checklist on every Crohn's patient at the end of your CTE or your MRE. Go through that checklist. Are there gallstones? Have they had a cholecystectomy? Do I see any kidney stones? Do I see evidence of pancreatitis or cholangitis? Do I see sacroiliitis or avascular necrosis? And if you check off those six boxes on every case, I promise you will improve your sensitivity for extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease. Thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this three-part series on Crohn's disease. If you have, please hit subscribe, go look through my other screencasts, and I hope you can find some additional topics of interest that will help you become a better radiologist. Thank you.